Uh, it's lovely to be here and I uh, appreciate very much the uh, invitation to celebrate with you the uh, 350th anniversary of your university. So what I want to uh, talk about today is a little bit of the research that we've done trying to bridge this gap between the perception of music and the pleasure that we derive from it. And before we get there, I just have a couple of preliminary remarks. Um, the first of which is, is just very general. A question I'm often asked is, well, why are you studying music? And 30 years ago when I started doing this work, you know, I would put in a grant application and the, that would be the question. It's like, why aren't you studying something important like language? I'm not making that up. So um, I think the best answer to this is actually uh, literally written in stone on the front of our building. If you ever come to Montreal and you visit the Neurological Institute, you'll see this quote from our founder, Wilder Penfield, who basically said that the problem of neurology is to understand man himself. In other words, in more contemporary language, what neuroscience is trying to do is to understand what it is to be human. And I think this is uh, sort of an insightful statement, and I would argue that um, music in particular and arts and aesthetics in general are such an integral part of being human that if we actually want to do the job on, of understanding the nervous system um, and how it creates the human species, then we need to look at those more complex features. Now, um, Stan Dan has already uh, mentioned some of the uh, interesting archaeological findings that indicate that, in fact, music is uh, an integral part of being human, going back as far as we know, as long as there were humans. Um, these uh, flutes, for instance, were uh, found by some investigators um, in China, and these are only about 7,000 years old, but what's remarkable is that they can still be played, and here's a recording of what one of them sounds like. It's really quite beautiful, isn't it? Um, and you ha have to consider the, um, the fact that to create these flutes, the distance between the holes has to be very carefully measured so that you get the appropriate scale. In this case, for instance, it's a pentatonic scale, which is, in fact, still commonly used in uh, Chinese music. Um, more ancient ones were uh, discovered, as, as mentioned by Stan, um, in uh, the Danube Valley, and these are even uh, older, they're from the upper, Pal upper Paleolithic period, which is interesting because that's a time during which um, most of Northern Europe was under glaciation. So where we are now, I suppose, was under several kilometers of ice, meaning that uh, the environment was not that easy to live in, and yet our ancestors were spending a lot of time making these intricate instruments. So it must have been quite meaningful and important for them to do this, that they would expend resources. Now, I'm not really going to talk about the evolution of music, However, uh, just to get us into the, the questions that I want to ask, I guess we do need to consider why it is that we have music. And um, if we accept the idea that music is part of this original mental machinery that we have, uh, then what good is it? Why do we have it? And of course, um, Darwin considered this question. And his most famous quote about music is this one. He said, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing music are faculties of any direct use, they must be ranked as the most mysterious that humans are endowed with. In other words, he had no idea. He just threw up his hands and said, it's mysterious, I have no idea. That was in 1871. However, 10 years later, he's writing his autobiography, and he's reflecting on his own personal um, state that he's in, and as you may know, he was rather depressed late in life. His favorite daughter had died uh, very young, and he has this to say. If I had to live my life again, I would have made a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week, for perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied would thus have been, been kept active through use. Which is, I find, a very insightful statement. And then he goes on to say, the loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. So what he's saying is that without music, 
life is really, you know, very um, unpleasant and very empty. Um, and I think this is actually the answer to the question that he had posed earlier, in fact, even though he maybe didn't quite recognize it as the answer. And so that's what I'm going to focus on, is this idea that music brings about emotions and gives us pleasure. And therefore, we have to ask, what is the origin of this? Music can arouse emotions. We can use music to express uh, and to communicate emotions and also to regulate our mood states, uh, either self-regulation by uh, choosing music, for instance, to suit your mood or to regulate the emotional state of others, such as uh, a mother singing to its baby to calm it down or uh, a dictator playing loud martial music to get people ready to uh, go into battle. So I'm not going to talk about all the many different aspects of emotion that music is capable of. I'm just going to focus on the idea of pleasure and try to address this question of how it is that music gives us pleasure. And the answer basically uh, goes along these three lines. And so these three points are the content of my lecture today. Um, first, I'll outline some of the neural mechanisms that are important for the production and the perception of music. And those involve the auditory cortex and many of the circuits associated with it. Second, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the mechanisms having to do with pleasure, reward, and motivation, generally, not just about music. Um, and that involves a different set of structures, notably the striatum and a lot of other related uh, areas of the brain. And then I'm going to argue that it's the interactions between those two systems, namely the music processing systems and the reward systems, um, that are the source of the pleasure that we experience from music. So that's sort of my thesis. Uh, just to give you a very simplistic uh, overview of some of the circuitry involved in the uh, production and perception of music, we have this diagram from a review paper that uh, I wrote uh, with some of my colleagues and students um, actually a good decade ago. And here's a uh, close-up of it. And the features of interest here um, are the auditory cortex shown here in green and its connections to areas of the motor cortex up here, in particular, the premotor regions, as well as uh, frontal, prefrontal cortex, and also a other route going back here to the uh, parietal lobe. And uh, we have a lot of different evidence from many, many different experiments that I won't have time to tell you about, uh, that it's the interactions between these different systems, in particular, the auditory system as the input system, the motor system, of course, is the output system, but then the interface between these two which is especially the parietal cortex where you have integration of sensory and motor, and the premotor cortex where you have um, the organization of complex motor plans and motor sequences. Here's another diagram to illustrate these two uh, pathways uh, originating from the auditory cortex, which is shown here in color. And so you have a dorsal stream which goes up into the uh, parietal cortex and the premotor regions, and you have a ventral stream which goes down into the temporal lobe and eventually reaches the inferior frontal cortex. Now, if we, again, go back historically, um, going back to Penfield, who's depicted here, he actually uh, observed some interesting phenomena that when he was operating on uh, um, epilepsy patients who were awake during the procedure so that he could map out different locations, every so often, when he would place an electrode and pass a brief current at that position, the patient would report that they would hear music. This didn't happen that often, but when it did happen, it was confined exclusively to the uh, temporal cortex here, the superior temporal gyrus, which corresponds to these uh, color areas that I'm showing you here. What's interesting about this is that the music was fully formed, was very clear, it was a hallucination. In fact, one patient actually said that they heard the music and questioned why someone would bring a radio into the operating theater. She didn't think it was very hygienic. Um, so it was that, you know, live of a, of a sensation. Um, and what that means is that some kind of musical information is stored, some kind of representation of that information is stored such that it can be reactivated when you put the electrode there. We think that this is also the uh, mechanism whereby we can have musical imagery. So musical imagery refers to the ability to imagine music in your mind's ear, as it were, uh, when it's not physically present. And the best example of this, of course, is Beethoven, who, as you know, was quite completely deaf later in his life and uh, nonetheless was able to compose magnificent music. Therefore, he must have been able to imagine those sounds uh, 
uh, very, very accurately so that he could write them down. Now, we don't have Beethoven to scan, but we can do uh, experiments to look at the activity of the auditory cortex with musical stimuli, either when they're physically present or when you're imagining them. And this is from uh, an fMRI study that we did a few years ago with uh, Sibylla Herholtz. And uh, what you see in the orange are the um, cortical areas that respond to sound. So all of the superior temporal cortex, shown here in orange. What's interesting is the green regions, because the green represents the areas that are active not only for physically present sound, but also for imagined sound. So in other words, a subset of those regions that are important for the uh, perceptual analysis of music are also recruited uh, even in the absence of sound when you're imagining that same music. As well, I will call your attention to the fact that we have recruitment of uh, dorsal premotor cortex here and inferior frontal gyrus, which are um, no doubt important for the elicitation of, uh, of the music from memory, because this is, after all, a retrieval from memory. Now, um, there are many other experiments I could tell you about with respect to the um, input side, but I just want to focus briefly on the output side, because you can't perceive music unless someone has played it, right? Unless there's a performance of it of some sort. And so we want to look at uh, what's going on there. And I want to emphasize the fact that um, in the production of music, you have an extremely accurate um, control over your motor system because you have to execute movements on whatever instrument you're playing, or even if you're singing, you have to be able to control your motor system very, very accurately. And this is nicely demonstrated by this motion capture video from my colleague, Marcella Wanderley, which shows the trajectories of movement of a violinist as um, she is playing uh, one of the Bach partitas. And I want, to, want you to look at this. This is a front view here. This is the top view, and here you have the force and velocity profiles. But here you'll notice that as the music unfolds, certain very specific patterns can be visualized. See, the size of the circle is related to the uh, volume of the sound, right? Now she's going to alternate between two strings forming a beautiful figure eight pattern. You see how those traces overlap almost perfectly? Of course, there's no visual cue here, right? It's just the, the playing. Sometimes, sometimes I think we should just stop the lecture here and listen to the rest of the partita. Now, we have been unable to put a violin into the scanner, but we have been able to put a cello into the scanner. This is one of my uh, students, who's a, a cellist by night and a neuroscientist by day. And she's playing a uh, specially constructed uh, optoacoustical cello, which is MR compatible. As you can see, here it is inside the scanner. You play it with a tiny little bow like this. So it's sort of limited in terms of exactly what you can play. But what's cool about it is that it allows us to actually study music production inside the scanner. And um, we, we're doing ongoing experiments with this, but one of the recent findings here, just to illustrate the brain activity pattern, is really very consistent with the model that we presented uh, earlier, which is to say, when you're playing, you have the interaction between, of course, auditory systems, but also these premotor regions and the parietal cortex uh, as the interface between sensory and motor. And the parietal uh, cortex in particular is most active when you have to adjust your movement based on the sound that you're getting. So if we perturb the uh, pitch, for instance, requiring an adjustment of the cellist's hand, that's when you really see the um, uh, activity increase in that region. Now, uh, I've shown you how accurately uh, musicians can play when they're very well trained. As, uh, raising the question of plasticity. What happens, what changes in the brain of the musician when they become very, very skilled? And the idea that musical training might change brain structure was actually first proposed, as far as I know, by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who, uh, as you know, obtained the Nobel Prize um, together with Golgi for his work on uh, histology. But he had this to say in 1904. 
The ability of a pianist is not accessible to the uneducated man since the acquisition of new skills requires many years of mental and physical practice. To understand this complex phenomenon fully, it becomes necessary to admit the formation of new pathways via progressive growth and branching of dendritic arborizations and nerve terminals. This is really a pretty remarkable statement from 1904, right? Of course, he had zero evidence that this was true. Um, and you can't do histology on a live human, at least not yet. Maybe with high field imaging, we might be able to. But we can look at cortical thickness in musicians, and indeed, we do see that there are changes in the structure of the brain, particularly in auditory cortex and motor cortex, which makes sense, um, and also in portions of the frontal lobes, including some of the premotor regions. So we uh, believe that this represents uh, experience-dependent plasticity, and we have other evidence that indicates that the degree of change is linked, first of all, to the age at which you started to train, and secondly, it is also linked to the degree of um, expertise that you actually have in the performance of the instrument. So all of these different pathways are related to many different uh, uh, functions. I haven't really had time to develop all of these things, but the auditory cortex and its connections are important for encoding of sound features like pitch and duration, for imagery. Um, I haven't talked about expectancies. That's an important issue. Uh, I haven't talked about working memory, another important issue. Um, and these pathways are enhanced with training. So this is the sensory and perceptual and motor part of the system. But it doesn't really tell us very much about pleasure. I promised you I was going to try to explain pleasure. So to try to understand pleasure, we want to think about so what, are some of the thing, what are some of the things that give us pleasure? Well, here are a few of them that some of you may have experienced at various times. I don't know if you should try them all simultaneously, maybe not. Um, what's interesting about these different stimuli, like food or sexual activity or drugs, is that um, they're biologically important. They're necessary for survival, such as food or sex. Um, or in the case of drugs, they're of course the opposite of necessary for survival. They can actually kill you. But the reason they're so powerful is because they engage the same mechanisms that are biologically relevant. Um, and they can become very addictive. So some years ago, we started doing experiments to see if music could also um, activate the same system. And anatomically, uh, it's a very complex system. I don't have time to go into all of the different uh, subsections involved. But let's focus on the striatum, which is found deep in the middle of the brain and consists of the caudate and nucleus accumbens. Um, so this is a very different set of brain structures than the cortical systems that I showed you a moment ago. Um, and we know from brain imaging experiments that the striatum is very reliably activated for these kinds of rewards, like uh, in experiments where people are given food, or in experiments where people are gambling and receiving money, you see activity in the reward system, and in erotic experiments, you also see the same thing. So when you do experiments with musical pleasure, you actually see the same structures, in particular the ventral striatum shown here. This is from three different studies that we've done in our lab using three different techniques. In the first one, we're looking at cerebral blood flow. In the second one, we're looking at dopamine binding potential. And the third one, we're looking at blood oxygenation. We very consistently see recruitment of the striatum with highly pleasurable music. So um, this is, I think, uh, not only a demonstration of the implication of the system in music, but also a good reminder that, in fact, um, neuroimaging experiments, despite what you might read, are actually highly replicable if you sort of, you know, do them very carefully. And I think we've seen some evidence along those lines from the other uh, speakers today as well. Now, um, I want to focus a little bit more on this last experiment that was done by one of my students, Valerie Selimpour, because here um, she was looking at not only the recruitment of the reward system, but also how it might interact with the rest of the brain. And here's how she did her experiment. For, um, for each in individual subject, we had them listen to e one of 70 different musical excerpts that had been pre-selected so as to be within a genre that they would probably like, but it was all new music to them. These were clips that we found on the internet from um, uh, music that had just recently been posted. And so what you do is in the experiment is you listen to 30 seconds of that music, and then we used a kind of a neuroeconomics paradigm. We asked people, well, how much money would you spend to purchase that music? So if you're listening to iTunes 
and you hear the clip for 30 seconds, you want to buy it, and if so, how much money? And so, for instance, for subject one, for clip one, they didn't like it, so they gave it zero, whereas for clip number two, they gave it 99 cents, and for number 70, they gave it $2. And the profile is different for each individual. But what this allows us to do is to use the music value as a regressor on the brain imaging activity so that we can see which parts of the brain change their activity as a function of how much value you, the listener, are assigning to it. So this is a way of um, quantifying the, um, the reward value of that music. And just because I want to uh, show you some of the music we've used, this is one of the pieces that was used for this experiment. Would anybody give me 99 cents for that? I, I wouldn't pay any money for it, personally. <laughs> this one's a little better. This is kind of techno pop. There's some syncopation in this that I like. That syncopation right there is kind of nice. I still prefer Bach, but our listeners like this music. And um, so if we look at the pattern of brain activity as a function of the amount of money, we indeed see the nucleus accumbens, which is the ventral striatum. So this is the part of the brain that responds most strongly, the reward system is responding most strongly as a function of the value that you assign to it. But interestingly, that's not all that happens. So we also looked at the connectivity between this reward system and the rest of the brain. So by connectivity in this context, I just mean the temporal coupling between the signals. So high connectivity means the signals are highly correlated in time, and if they're low correlation, then we have low connectivity. And when we look everywhere in the, in the brain, among the regions that we see, there's a very strong enhancement of connectivity between auditory cortex and the striatum as a function of the reward value assigned. In other words, the more you like it, the more your auditory system is in connection with your reward system. And so this is, I think, an important finding because it links together these two systems that I've been talking about, the perceptual motoric sort of uh, system, which is largely cortically based, and the reward system, which is largely subcortically based. These two systems are interacting with each other um, in the context of highly pleasurable music. And Having this finding allows us to ask a further question, which is, what would happen if this mechanism is disrupted? And this is important because if this model is correct, then we would predict that if there's a disruption somehow between these two systems, then it would affect how music might be um, evaluated. So working together with some of my uh, colleagues uh, in the University of Barcelona and with Ernest Mas Herrero, who is now uh, a postdoc in my lab, we identified people who varied in the degree of hedonic response to music. So we quizzed them on several different kinds of um, stimuli that might give people pleasure, and we found some people who, although they have perfectly normal responses to food, money, and sex, and so on, just don't like music. Music is just nothing really special for them. We also, of course, found people that we call hyperhedonics. These are people like me and like maybe some of you, who just couldn't imagine living life without music. And then there's other sort of average people who like music about as much as they like food or exercise. Or, um, when we, this is, these are just behavioral ratings. When we actually give people music that is normally considered to be highly pleasurable, and we measure psychophysiological responses, so skin conductance, which is a measure of physiological arousal, and heart rate, which is also similarly linked to arousal, oops, we see that the people with musical anhedonia have very, very low scores on these tests compared to the people with hyperhedonia, so-called, who actually have a slightly higher response than the average. And for the heart rate, it's a similar pattern. So this is not just um, that they're reporting that they like music less, they actually experience it as less uh, arousing, less interesting. When we put them into the scanner, um, we see something interesting. Sorry, there's a slide missing here, I think. Uh, 
Where did it go? Ah, here it is. So when we put them into the scanner, what we see is, uh, can you see that? Yes. So um, the, we had a control task, which is a gambling task, shown in green. And then we had the um, uh, music task. And what you see is that the response to the gambling task is in the reward areas, in the nucleus accumbens, is high for everybody. However, the one place where there's a difference is right here. So the people with musical anhedonia do not show a response in this hotspot here, which is the ventral stratum, either on the left or on the right, whereas they do show a normal response to gambling. So this shows that they have a lower response. And more interesting still, when we look at the relationship between the auditory cortex, shown in blue here, and the striatum, so we're looking at the functional connectivity between those two systems, we see that it's very much reduced in the people with musical anhedonia. The people with average response have an average response, and the people with hyperhedonia, the music lovers, have an enhanced response. So in other words, those two systems that I'm talking about, the auditory and the reward system, when, for whatever reason, when they're not interacting, you just don't get pleasure. And when they're, act when they're interacting to a great extent, then you get maximal pleasure. And so what it means is that somehow music is uh, a way in which um, human beings have figured out, they've developed a system that allows us to enhance our emotional arousal or uh, thereby allowing us regulation of emotion via the interaction of these two systems. And I think what's interesting is that the one on the right, the uh, reward system, is actually um, phylogenetically ancient in the sense that it is very similar between humans and rodents, for example. A lot of the research in uh, the reward system is carried out in rodents because it's a good model system. Whereas the um, cortical cortical sort of loops that are important for perception and production are really quite phylogenetically recent um, and uh, really only exist in humans. So it's this interesting uh, link between some of the oldest parts of the brain and some of the newest parts of the brain. And if I have one more minute, do I have one more minute? Yes. Um, I just want to tell you about one last finding that we just obtained uh, a couple of months ago, which I find very compelling, and that is the following. Um, everything I've shown you up until now, all of these results, um, a critic might say, yeah, but you know, functional imaging, um, that's fine, but it's all correlational, right? You're not actually, um, you're measuring patterns of activity, but you're not actually intervening into the system itself. So we thought maybe we could test for a causal relationship between the activity of the reward system and musical pleasure. And we are using a technique that actually was developed by um, Strafella and Paus and uh, Dagger some years ago. They found that if you stimulate this part of the brain, dorsal prefrontal cortex, with transcranial magnetic stimulation, because of the connections between this region and the striatum, you can actually see dopamine release in the striatum. So you stimulate here, because with TMS, you can only stimulate the surface, not the deep part of the brain. But because those two regions are highly interconnected, you can get a big response in the striatum. And so this is what we've done. And we've stimulated with two different protocols, one of which is an excitatory protocol, which uh, increases activity, and the other is an inhibitory protocol, which decreases activity. And the paradigm we're using, I won't go into the detail, but it's very, very similar to what Valerie Salampour used in that other study where you listen to excerpts of music and had to say how much money you want to give to them. And when we use the excitatory protocol compared to the inhibitory protocol, people say that they like the music more with excitation, and they say they like the music less with inhibition. When we measure their skin conductance, there's more arousal during the excitation and less arousal during the inhibition. And when we ask them how much money they want to give, they spend more money when we stimulate them positively, and they spend less money when we stimulate them negatively, which I find kind of like science fiction. But it's actually true, and we've actually replicated it in a second study that we're still working on. So this shows that, in fact, uh, these circuits are really the source of the pleasure, because we can manipulate them. We can upregulate them or downregulate them, and that has direct uh, consequences on behavior. <clears throat> 
And with that, I will um, end and just be sure to thank all of the many different uh, students, uh, postdocs, and um, collaborators with whom I've worked. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Satore. Um, I have a question first, and then I'll let you have the word if you want it. Uh, I wonder, what do we know about differences or similarities when we listen to music, when we perform it, and when we dance? Hmm. Yes. So, um, as I sort of alluded to, there's this close coupling between the auditory and the motor systems. Yeah. And um, the previous speaker also mentioned mirror neurons, which is relevant in this context. So what we and many other labs have seen is that uh, when you're listening to music that you know how to perform, you actually activate the motor circuitry, the same pathways. We've even shown this in a longitudinal study where we trained people, so we had them listen to the same pieces of music before they knew how to play them and then after they knew how to play them. And you only see this sensory motor interaction um, after learning to play them. With respect to dance, um, there are some specific adaptations. Uh, I haven't done this work, but actually my spouse, Virginia Penhune, has done some research on dancers and has a couple of papers uh, in your image on this topic. And they're finding um, rather specific adaptations to dance that differ from those of musicians, because musicians um, have the auditory motor interaction, whereas the dancers don't. They have more auditory visual. And also dancers have more full body representation because they use all their limbs, whereas musicians tend to use only some specific subset of effectors to, uh, to actually play the instrument. Right. Thank you. Interesting. Um, okay. Any hands in the air? Yep. Oh, way back. Okay. This will test me for How sure. How good is your arm, your throwing arm? <laughs> No, 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 you won't shout because then the people in adjoining rooms or watching the stream won't hear you. <laughs> Don't be scared, it's soft. And keep throwing it. Hold your hands up so they can see where to throw. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding the strong emotions that music can uh, induce. For example, um, during um, a, a singing the anthem, people can burst into tears, a complete stadium can burst into tears, or uh, more negatively or differently, a grief. You can, if a person grieving hears a sound during the ceremony, actually the entire congregations may start mm -hmm. crying. Yes, so but there are... That, that, dopamine system too? Or? Yeah, so there are many different um, uh, ways in which music can result in emotion. So in some cases, it's what we might call um, associative memory. So in the case, for instance, of uh, an anthem, it might be um, a learned association. So you've heard this music before, it has a particular meaning for you because it's associated with your favorite soccer team, your country, uh, or whatever it is. Um, and so that it might induce emotion in, by that uh, means. But another mechanism, which I haven't talked about, um, is with respect to social engagement. So music can serve very much as a way uh, for social bonding. And so in the case of, for instance, uh, people at a, a sporting event, they might all sing together, and singing together very often leads to group cohesion. Similarly, in uh, religious ceremonies, very, very often people will be singing together and that gives them a sense of belonging to that group. What I think is, uh, so the, there are many different, there are other mechanisms besides those. What I think is interesting, however, is that music can induce emotion even in the absence of any of those things. So pure music, just the relationships between the tones to music that you've never heard before, that has no associations, that has no particular meaning, can still induce tears of joy or chills response. Um, and so that's part of what makes music powerful is that it is intrinsically uh, emotion um, producing and can also serve in these other contexts like social context or uh, associative context. 
We had one more question here in the back, I think. Over there, uh, look, put your hands up and look to your side. Right, there we go. Put your hands up again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, the possible uh, positive effect between music listening and learning, the Mozart effect? Yeah, that's, that's uh, quite controversial. And um, the Mozart effect as such has, I think, pretty much been shown to, uh, to be an artifact of various uh, testing procedures. Um, the, the general idea that um, music might uh, sort of make you smarter is, I, I think, way too simplistic. And you have to consider, you know, smarter in relation to what? Because if you spend a lot of time playing music, that's also time that you didn't spend learning something else. And as uh, Stan mentioned today, if you're a mathematician, you might be bad at faces. Well, if you're a musician, you, I think you may also have some enhancements and some losses. So I, I don't think it's a very simple equation between uh, music and enhancement of other cognitive abilities. That said, there are some possibilities that are of interest to use music in certain populations, like people with mild cognitive impairment, where the arousing effect of music and the emotional aspects that I've mentioned um, might be important enough to um, essentially upregulate the entire system, thereby allowing something like learning to happen more readily than it would without that stimulus. So that's a potential uh, interesting avenue of research that, that people are actively working on right now. And with pleasurable, uh, pleasurable we, music, it, it, uh, it activates more areas of the brain, maybe. It activates more areas than what? Yeah, than with music that you don't like. Oh, no. uh, music that you don't like, that's a different story. There are, there are just as many areas, but they're different ones than the reward system. Now we'll pass it forward. We have a gentleman there and there, and we have one here, and I think we also have somebody over here. So please okay. keep your uh, questions brief, and we'll try to keep the answers brief okay. and see if we can cover in all that. Go ahead. Uh, I have two questions. You mentioned <laughs> that, that, that uh, um, when you listen to music, you could see structural changes in the brain. Does that mean that new synapses are grown? Uh, is the first question. And the second one is uh, you mentioned that if you stimulate uh, a certain nerve cell, uh, the person could hear a piece of music. Does that mean that every piece of music I remember has one nerve cell uh, representing it? Yeah, so the, with respect to the second question, I, I did not uh, claim that there's like a, uh, a single neuron representation uh, for music. Um, not sure that anyone has study that. As you may know, there are some claims for things like uh, person identity being represented at single neuron level. Um, I'm not an expert on that, so I wouldn't want to say very much. Uh, with respect to your first question, what we've measured is cortical thickness, which of course is a very gross metric. It's the best we can do with current technology in vivo. Um, so changes in cortical thickness are uh, associated with many, many, many different underlying physiological changes. It could be dendritic arborization, it could be myelination, it could be um, changes in cell size, it could be changes in cell packing density. Um, that's very much still uh, to be worked out. People are using uh, animal models to try to look at that. Okay. Thank you. And pass it to the gentleman here. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yeah. A short question. Do you know what happens to the brain to a person that's forced to listen to music they hate? Short answer, no. <laughs> That's a very brief answer and a very clear one. And, and, why, and why would you do that anyway? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> Ask any parent of young kids and they'll know why the question is relevant. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you showed us the stuff where uh, there are people who don't enjoy music at all. And if uh, music is related to dopamine because you enjoy it, uh, why are there people who don't enjoy music at all? Is it they they lack some sort of synapse or? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I don't have a slide here, but um, we have a, a st so in this group of people, as you can see, the the interaction between these two systems is reduced, and so we've actually been looking at the pathways uh, 
And there are no pathways that connect the auditory system directly to the reward system. However, there are pathways that go from auditory to um, medial prefrontal cortex and from reward system to medial prefrontal cortex. And we do see changes in those pathways in these individuals. So it, it seems like there is a change in the actual connection. Now, whether that's a cause or an effect remains to be seen, right? Because it could be that those pathways are somehow decreased from lack of use. Or it could be that the reason they have this anhedonia is because the pathways are reduced in the first place. Right, so right. what comes first is not Yeah, so we don't clear. know, but... Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, over there. <laughs> Oof! <laughs> that was a hard one. <laughs> but, but efficient, are you okay? Okay, good. <laughs> um, what does, uh, why does uh, some intervals, uh, like on the piano, or some uh, chords sound uh, like bad? And why does mm. some uh, sound good? Yes, um, that's an interesting question. Why do some intervals sound more pleasant than others? Um, there are two answers, both of them wrong. <laughs> One is that it's all, it all has to do with the uh, beats, the interference patterns between two, so if you have two tones of slightly different frequencies, they physically interact, they produce a beating pattern. Um, and so dissonant intervals tend to have more beats, and so people have thought that's why, but that doesn't explain it because there are a dozen reasons why that doesn't explain it. The other theory is that it's all culturally learned, it's all completely arbitrary, and you just learn it um, from your culture, and that um, seems an attractive uh, idea if you're a cultural relativist. However, if you look across hundreds of different cultures, you will see that about 90% of them agree on what are the intervals that are considered positive or negative. So those two extremes are wrong. There's something in the middle that's right that we don't know yet. So okay. <laughs> good area for research. Okay, Thank one, the very last question, a brief one before we end this session. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if there's uh, like uh, a difference if you add a visual layer to it, like in a live perfor performance compared to like a recorded studio production? Yeah, that's an interesting question. There is some evidence that um, the addition of, the, uh, of a visual input does uh, make a difference because visual cues uh, can actually help focus your attention on certain musical features. In fact, musicians often will use gestures when they're, when they're playing. It depends on the music, it depends on the musical style. Um, so you can, you can emphasize certain moments in the music by moving around. Um, of course, in a live performance, you have more than just the visual input. You have all the social input, you have a lot of other stuff going on. So there is evidence that that makes a difference. However, the fact is that um, audio recordings since they came into existence 100 years ago or something, have been immensely successful. So my personal opinion is that, yeah, the visual input makes some difference, but it can't be that important or else we wouldn't all go around listening to music with our, with our earphones in there, right, without visual cues. So I think it's 99% auditory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert Satori. Thank you.